here we are in the beautiful Cotswolds. It's been a while since I was last involved with the Masterclass project, uh, the big fish off of Monster Carp and all the traveling and the editing that that takes up so much of my time. But I'm really, really passionate and inspired for this particular chapter. One man, three lakes, a few methods, and it was inspired by social media. People always ask whether if they're going to this lake or that lake, change what they're doing you know do they have to reinvent the wheel from venue to venue and you don't wherever you go and I, I found it myself a carp is a carp whether you live up north whether you live in Timbuktu or in Essex a carp is a carp and the same methods will work the world over we're just about to arrive at Horseshoe I'm really excited for the first leg in this little Hamidi road show so let's get as they say the show on the road Horseshoe Lake and the Carp Society are under new management, which means this incredible lake is getting the love it deserves once again. As the name suggests, this lake is a horseshoe shape. This means the lake is divided into two distinct parts. You've got Winter Bay, which averages 8 to 12 foot, and then Summer Bay, which is much shallower at around 3 to 5 foot. I start by driving up to Winter Point. This swim commands lots of water, so it's a great place to spot any signs of movement. It's important to not just rock up at the first swim you see and start fishing. Have a look around the lake and see if you can find the carp. On this occasion, I didn't see many signs of fish, so I head over to the other side of the lake where I suspect the carp will be too. Well, here we are, the famous Summer Bay and actually really living up to its reputation. It's hot and on cue, there's loads of carp here. The forecast tomorrow is about 28 or 29, so in my language, that's Scorchio. And even if we don't manage to nick something this evening once everything's set up, we might get plenty of chances tomorrow. But there's always the backup of moving elsewhere, you know, if the fish do the off or don't turn up in numbers. But hopefully they'll just stay here because, because we're all here. It's just one big happy, merry party. And uh, the worst that could happen is I just see carp swim all over my baits all night. This is very, very exciting indeed. I'm gonna go and start getting the kit out of the van. Sweet. I absolutely love fishing in the summer, more because it's just pleasant to be there. Wildlife's at its richest. Often in the day when the sun's at its highest, uh, the carp will go towards weed beds and they'll literally be sitting in weed, sucking up the oxygen. But hopefully at night they start feeding those sort of clearer areas and start having a lookout. It is really, no matter what, what you've got on the end, how good your bait is, it's an old adage, everyone will tell you, location, location, location. And on a big lake like this, that is paramount. When fishing a couple of venues back to back, I always bring a good selection of bait. With a carp preoccupied in the oxygen rich weed, it's a perfect time to make up the spod mix. This will allow the liquids to soak in before you get it out. I start by adding 10 mil link and cell boilies. Then in goes some boilie crumb. After a little mix up, I add some of the smart liquid, which smells marvelous. Next, I add some response pellets, then some larger lips pellets, which will take longer to break down. The mix wouldn't be the same without these two ingredients, so in goes some sweet corn and hemp. There's just one final ingredient I like to add to the mix. There you go, copper load of that. And the last ingredient, is the smart ground bait, which really complements the smart liquid in there as well. And that's just sort of going to coat all the loose feed that's in the buffet, if you like. And then that's going to be quite active. So when you put it out there, when these fish are cruising around, you've got little bits of hemp, hempy ground bait, you've got that fat sauce coming off, and it's just going to be alive out there for you, rather than just sitting dormant, you know, a few standard boilies on the deck, that's going to be doing something, you know, working over time, hopefully. That'll do for me though. Might even eat that for me dinner. As light levels lower, so does the amount of oxygen in the weed. This will normally push the carp out from the weed beds into clearer open water, hopefully seeking out anglers' baits in the dark. With the aim of getting a quick bite, a solid bag is my preferred approach. Solid bags are in effect a small parcel with loads of attraction inside. You can put pretty much anything in them as long as they're PVA friendly and allow you to pack the bag nice and tightly. I like to use mainline smart ground bait, PVA and spot pellets and some of the smart liquid. It's always best to use smaller items of bait in the bag. This way you'll be able to compress them, making it easier to cast further and accurately.
And I've got a little trick in there. So I've got the solid bag towel rubber there onto a drop off inline system, dead simple. A little bit of putty on the end there just to sink the line nearest the rig. And then inside the solid bag, what I've done is I've got a little short three and a half inch length of dark matter braid. On that is a size four crank from the Kamakura range. I've had to crush the barb because it's a barbless only rule on horseshoe. Then I've got a micro ring swivel on the shank, followed by a hook bead and a little red kicker. Now to the ring swivel, what I've done is I've threaded on uh, a link wafter that's been soaking in Squid Supreme and Garlic Supreme goo and a little bit of the Smart Liquid. And around that, I've wrapped a bit of the Smart Paste. Really, really good, because what that does, it breaks down and lets off a little fatty vapor. And then underneath that, you've then got the goo coming out as well. So it's all gonna be going off. This has got a little bit more bang for your buck. I'm gonna aim to where I'm seeing the fish and hopefully we might snare something, you never know. Those of you with an eagle eye would have noticed I put two boilies attached to the hook with some PVA tape. These are actually pop-ups and will help me identify that the bag is presented well on the weedy bottom. If the pop-ups take a while to reach the surface, it would indicate that I'm fishing in dense weed and will probably justify a recast. However, if they don't take long to reach the surface, as they don't in this case, then the rig should be presented well enough for a bite, even in the weediest of lakes. Oh yeah, pop-ups have uh, shot up lovely and quick, probably inside of 15 seconds. So I know, even though I've cast that blind, that's fishing that. Put a couple of rods out. Just see where we go. Five in the evening. Take stock, hatch a plan. Oh. Summer Bay is full of weed, so to find those clear spots quickly and with the least disturbance, there's one device that has become a must have in my armory. Deeper, welcome to the party. Oh yeah, struck gold straight away to be fair. It's a nice little clear spot. The deeper range of fish finders or sonar feature finders, if you like, are an absolute godsend if you're limited for time. You know, I'm not one for wanting to get in a swim and crash in the marker, float around everywhere or a bare lead, getting it clogged up in weed, winding it back in, taking a load of weed off, starting again. With a deeper, it's on the surface. So you're able to explore from the surface, looking down, you're gonna find an area that looks quite good and then you can explore it with a lead, get it clipped up, get it back out there, and you're gonna find something to fish effectively onto much quicker than you would using a marker float or a bare lead. Of course, use a marker float after, go from digital to analog, but you're mad. Honestly, I, can't, I couldn't sit across a table with someone and honestly respect that person if they could give me a solid argument not to use one. Madness. With a lovely spot located by the deeper and marker lead, it was now time to introduce a bit of grub. 12 to 15 medium spoms onto the holes in the weed should be fine in these hot weather conditions. It's important not to put too much in, as you can't take it out. I always use a high visual hook bait when fishing over a spreader bait. It's vital as you can still get a bite even if the fish don't feed very hard. As I'm fishing with mono, I make sure I clip my fishing rods three to four foot shy of the distance of the spot. This allows for the stretch in the mono and will ensure the hook bait is sitting close to the baited area. The rig of choice here is the spinner rig presented mini chod style on a clear ring swivel dark matter leader with a heli safe added onto it. Another winning setup that will work anywhere on planet earth. Sadly, the night passed with no success. The pressure was now really on to produce the goods. I've never been one to just sit back and hope the rods will produce, so it became a case of try, try, try. First off, with the aid of our cameraman Kev, we fed a few resident carp down my right margin with some Lincoln fibre crumb. One kamikaze cast later, and we had a rig under those trees. Then the coots moved in and ruined that chance. Then we tried to mini zigs in open water, but there just wasn't the same number of fish here today. With the afternoon upon us, we then located some fish in the bottom corner of Summer Bay, but nothing was interested in feeding, apart from this happy little goose. That's it, go over there. 
With my tail between my legs, it was back to my swim for the night, which also proved uneventful. As the morning mist evaporated and with just a few hours of our scheduled time at Horseshoe remaining, we had to make a change. It's all well and good having methods you're confident in, but if you're not on fish that are willing to feed, then what hope do you have? I had a strong feeling that the fish could be in Winter Bay after a quiet night in Summer Bay. My suspicions were correct, in front of Winter Point were a number of carp cruising, leaping and generally making their awareness known. After years of carp fishing, I've learnt to read by the way the carp shows whether they're better to be fished for on the bottom or on zigs. On this occasion, I really knew these fish could be up for a zig. The deeper with a couple of casts revealed 8 to 12 foot of water. A 6 foot zig seemed perfect in this scenario. I could clearly tell the fish weren't super high up and staying there, rather cruising lower down than coming up for a little leap or flop. Recently, I've been experimenting with a new style of zig rig tying and it's caught me some cute fish in clear water already on my syndicate lake, the Rise in Essex. I like to use a nice big hook like a size 6 Kamakura crank. I then put my foam hook bait onto the zig line. Once I've done that, I hook the foam onto the shank so that it breaks up the line of the hook. Then whip the knotless knot from the inside of the hook before finishing it off with a coloured kicker. I'm a huge fan of these as I love the thought of making the hook as attractive as possible. My favoured lead system with zigs is always a drop off inline system. In weedy lakes you really don't want a heavy lead dragging behind a fish on a long zig hook link. This is the best lead system for zig fishing as the lead will always discharge when a fish is hooked in weedy conditions. It is far more effective than a standard lead clip. With two zigs tied, with two different colours of foam to cover my bases, it was now time to get the rods out to see if we can save the session right at the death. Not long after getting the rods out, my right hand rod was away. And so was I, getting some tackle out of the van. It's been such a hard session, honestly. Like this road show, talk about picking the hardest one to fish first. When I come over earlier to have a look, over the years of fishing, I can sort of see fish, I can tell by the speed they're moving or just how they show whether it's they're ready to be fished for on the deck or whether it's zig time. And I knew this was time to put a zig on. I really want to get this in. And a ball of weed, not good. Just going to keep the pressure on steady. Got nine pound zig line on. Oh yeah, we're back in. So when you when you get them in close on the lighter hook links, this is when sort of the accidents can happen. So be careful. We know we've been through a weed bed as well. Fish has been snagged up temporarily, so there could be nicks in that hook link. Take your time. Enjoy the moment. We've waited long enough. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely linear. <laughs> it's a lovely linear. Oh yes. Come on, please. Oh, that's the gulp of air we wanted. Oh, my heart is absolutely buried in my mouth. Come on, mate. Right. Come on, please. Go on. Go on. Go on. Yes. We've done it, boys and girls. We've done it. Ah, oh, first venue, fish in the net, one of the methods I told you about, jobs are good and feeling good. Oh, there you go, look at that. 24 pounds, 12 ounces of absolutely epic horseshoe carp. That's exactly why we came here. Thank you very much indeed. The wagons are gonna be rolling shortly. Pressure's off momentarily. I've got to now go and try to produce it somewhere else. Again, just a short period of time. Next one, we're literally a maximum of 24 hours there, so I've got to do it again, but I'm confident. I've got a little bit of buzz on now, so let's do this. For the next venue, I head southeast to just outside the town of Dorking. This is a famous old estate lake complex that I first viewed on TV back in the 90s when John Wilson fished here on the groundbreaking show Go Fishing. 
It was great to return here and film the big fish off on those old punts and catch some of its wily carp for the cameras a few years ago. It was now time to see if my latest armory of carp catching methods can produce the goods at Old Berry Hill. Oh, and I've been joined by a very special guest. Oh mate, what a lovely, lovely lake. It's so good to be back here. And for this part of my masterclass chapter, I'm really, really lucky to be joined by a very close friend of mine, someone that I've only met really in the last year. Exceptionally good, exceptionally gifted at getting the rig bang on the spot every time. His name's Jürgen. Jürgen, looking forward to it, mate? Ali, I'm so excited to be here. That's right, Jürgen. It's an absolute stunning place, isn't it, mate? Old Berry Hill, steeped in history. We're going to be going over to that tree line. You're going to be a busy boy today, Jürgen. I've just about had enough of casting. They worked me hard at Horseshoe. So look, you have a little brew. Chill yourself out. Enjoy the scenery. I'm going to get some rods set up. Lovely. Right, first rod is in the right hopper. I often keep the left hopper with a spiral in. So if I want to... Um, Put some loose feed out as well over the area. These spirals are ingenious things, they actually trickle bait out all around the spot. But what I've actually put in here is the same rig that we we're using at Horseshoe on one of the rods. It's the spinner rig with a boom, or the Ronnie rig as we like to call it, with a bumbleberry, almond supreme, and mango nana soaked pork ball pop up. That's what I want to have. I want to have a target over the loose feed, and the loose feed is important because. There's a lot of bream in here, so rather than using the pellets, the corn, even the hemp to start with, I've kept them to one side and I've gone with a boily only approach. In crumb, 10 miller and 14 miller format. I've got Lincoln fibre in 14 mils, Lincoln cell in 10 mils, and the fibre and link also basically blended up into chops and crumb. So we've got all sorts of attraction. And what I've done is I've laced that with the smart liquid just to give it a fatty coating, okay, which will be vaporing off the bottom, releasing a nice sort of cloud and scent as fish come over the area and hopefully that pop-up's just sitting there, prior to place, ready to be taken. So that's the first rod, and I think it's about time we've got Jürgen to work. I'm feeling fully recharged and ready to go. Oh my God, this place is unbelievably good looking. I sent Jürgen straight over to the tree line. Here the bottom is really silty, typical of an older state lake. I placed the first rod in about three foot of water on a firmer area of silt as shown by the RT4's echo sounder system. For the second rod, I chose to use a solid bag. Having two different proven methods out there gives me a barometer to work out which is best on any given water or session. This is the beauty of the autopilot system. It literally, with a press of a button, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Jürgen just does it all. What an absolute lad. But this is going towards the mouth of the jungle, or the far margin of the jungle, if you like. It goes quite a way down there. That looks pretty good to me there. And then quite simply, the bait's in the right hopper. Just slacken off a little bit so it doesn't spring back and sink to a bait. We can see it's 0.7 of a metre, which in your money is about three foot. Open right hopper, rigs down. Okay. So I've got the singles pointing as best as they can on a direct line to the spot. Obviously when you've got two rods out there, Unless I had single sticks, I can't get everyone, you know, bone straight, but I'm gonna get pretty, pretty close to that. And then look, there's clutches are ramped up. We're not here to play. Make it all nice and tight. When you fish to snags, the most important thing is when you get the bite is don't start pumping up and down. What we'll be doing is hooking it and we'll be walking backwards, yeah? Especially for the first four or five foot of the fight, just start progressively going back, back, back. Yeah, don't pump, don't pump. Just use the rod to, to winch the fish away from the area. One rod out, see that? No line can be given. That should literally just pull up tight, a few bleeps, and that's us in the game. With two rods positioned, it wasn't long until the first bite. Even though I was on it straight away and walked back with a rod in hand, the stretch in the mono meant the carp had taken me straight into the trees. 
It was now important that I went out in one of the punts over to the far margin to check the fish wasn't still on and ultimately remove any line and rigs, ensuring the safety of fish and bird life. There's my hook. You can see it, look, their masters are getting rid of it. Gives you an idea of what we're fishing to. With the rig removed, it was time to make some wholesale changes, as losing fish in snags is not an option. Luckily on Old Berry Hill, you're allowed to use braided mainline as long as you have a metre of protection nearest the hook. So I'm going to be using the Dark Matter leader, which is perfect. I use them all the time anyway. I absolutely love them. And I can use my heli safe on there, or I can use a solid bag towel rubber on there. Either way, I can fish exactly as I have been, but I'm going to use braid straight through. Hopefully that will solve the problem. There'll be no stretch, there's zero stretching braid. So when you get that first bleep, the only thing that can happen is they'll pull the rod off the rest. So I'll have to be even closer to the rods. As soon as it bleeps, grab it, walk back. That's it. Let's hope it all plays ball. With the midday summer heat in full flow, things had slowed down. But whilst I redid my other rod, of course, the unattended snag rod, now loaded with apex braid, was away. Well, that was fun. Been waiting all day. And this is the difference braid straight through makes. That carp went nowhere. This is on a pop up on a Ronnie rig. It gets us underway on Berry Hill. And here we go a lovely Estate Lake carp coming to the net. Here we go. Coming in. Get in the net. There we go, oh, very lively. And our first Berry Hill Carp of the session, I'm gonna give myself, I don't know, probably about 60, 65 and a half pounds. No, not really, <laughs> probably about 15 pounds. 15, 16 pounds I'm gonna go for. Not gonna weigh it, but it just shows, little move over to the apex, it was plain sailing. Let's hope that continues. Sadly, the only thing that continued was an onslaught of bream. It's safe to say I love most fish species, but have never seen a purpose for the existence of bream, which is probably why they decided to torture me for the afternoon. Elegant in the evening summer sunshine, glorious, making me one of the happiest anglers alive. Berry Hill has a variety of species across the stunning complex, but the old lake does hold loads of bream, which is great for the match angler wanting to build a big weight, but it isn't great when they find your bait as a carp angler and continue to give you hell. No matter what rig was out there, those slime bags would find it. With the evening drawing in, it was clear the carp had left the margins, which was probably why the bream were having a ball. As is always the case with any type of fishing, location is number one and I needed to make positional changes. Here at Berry Hill there's an old stream gully which I know the carp get caught off at night. So with the help of Jürgen I put two single Ronnie rigs with some loose feed into the area with a plan to cast a single solid bag off the bait along with a scattering of boilies to see if this could get the carp's attention. It was clear I'd made the perfect decision at just the right time. It's been a long old day to be fair. Literally all I did this time was just put a bit of the power particle mixed with, um, mixed with link and fibre boilies hole into the, uh, into the boat. But then I also loaded up the left spiral which meant I could trickle out bait left and right. So in effect, in about two minutes, I created what would have taken me probably 45 minutes with a spawn. Oh, 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 we're away, double take. <laughs> so look at that, we just, little adjustment, been hauling bream all day. Okay, going for yours first, mate, all right. Hooked after and landed before, how about that? Still my fish, that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> There's the old heli safe done his job on the uh, dark matter leader. Come on, baby. Yes. Two in the net. Wow, there we go. A pair of Estate Lake Commons. Bolts out of blue. Little adjustments in the spot. 
No rig changes, just the same stuff in a different position and bingo dingo, it's all come good. Thank you for being there to hit that rod. But there we go, lovely old carp. Good though, that's good. Might have to have another little go in a minute. With the carp clearly on the feed in our new gully location, I quickly made up another solid bag to dispatch onto the spot. It's amazing how tiny tweaks in rod position can make such dramatic differences. So remember, they don't always just stay in the snags. As evenings draw in on waters across the country, fish explore open water, and that's exactly what's happened here, as the newly cast solid bag is away again. This is the uh, solid bag rig that showed you on horseshoe as well. Dark matter, this one's just a three inch length of 20 pound dark matter braid. Crank hook, yellow kicker, micro ring swivel on the shank, and a hook bead. And this is a, an essential cell, cork dust wafter soaked in pineapple supreme and orange goo. That is the recipe, another common. Seems like this is the common channel. Go, and she goes. Look at that, lovely little common carp, nailed once again on a solid bag. And that's the beauty of them. You get them out there, full of attraction, the smart ground bait, the cork dust wafter soaked in the goose, and then a little bit of sherbet goose squeezed in there along with a bit of the smart liquid. Just means that they find it instantly. Cloudy water, as we've said, Maximum attraction, instant result. That's what it's all about. Night night, mate. The final leg of our roadshow sees us not only move across counties, but also seasons. We're now in the depths of winter and visiting a venue for the very first time. Well, you didn't think I was gonna do three sessions in the summer, did you? We are now at a new venue. This is uh, called Blue Lake on the Embryo roster. Um, brand spanking new, stocked with some absolutely stunning carp and I think in years to come this is going to be a premier water in England, somewhere to go and get a bite and that's exactly why we've come here. Um, often people choose the wrong venues in the winter. Um, we're into December now, not too far from Christmas um, and one of the big questions I always get asked is, Ali, you know, I'm going fishing in the winter, do I change things, do I use different rigs? And the answer is no. So I've come here to show you that I'm going to use exactly the same things we've been using in other parts of the chapter, but on a totally different lake and in the middle of winter, just to give you the confidence that you don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. Sadly, we arrived here in pitch black yesterday um, and we didn't hear anything, didn't see anything. So I decided to set up in a middle swim almost uh, halfway up along the lake. And the reason for that is it gives me options. I can also see most of the lake from where I am. So if fish show to my left or to my right, I can move on them or cast on them. Um, so once I'd done that, set up, I got the deeper out um, and the idea was just to see what the depths are. Um, always nice on a new water just to get a feel for it. I didn't want to start crashing the lead around and having a feel then. And the perfect thing is in the dark with the deeper you can float it around on the surface and you're going to pick out the different sort of gradients along the bottom. And um, I noticed that it was quite it shallowed up in the middle and then dipped down. And um, yeah, I had a nice little trough. And I forgot to say to you as well, the re another reason I set up here is at the weekend, just gone, we had a member of uh, Corda staff, one of the product development guys, Thomas Pashley here with his mate. And they actually had nine carp in 24 hours, including a few lovely 20s. And I thought, you know what? That's the last place a bit of bait went in, so why not set up there? So once I'd had a look, on the depths and saw a couple of likely looking areas on the deeper. In the dark I got the lead rod out um, again with braid and just had a little cast about to feel for the drop. That's really important no matter where I go I want to feel and find somewhere that's quite hard on the bottom um, and yeah I was able to locate a couple of nice spots um, so that was it that was what we'd done for the night got everything clipped up and then first light when we got up you know we started to clip up the rods get them out into position and then we introduced some bait. And uh, an important thing when you go to a lake, especially somewhere quite new, it's often they've been fed on pellets. And uh, this particular lake, they've got a particular type of pellet that's been introduced all through the summer months for the fish to get reared on and get bigger. And uh, you'd be mad not to use them. Uh, I've gone to lakes all over the world that have been fed on a house pellet, if you like, and um, 
Gillum's being one of them. We, you know, if you go to Gillum's in Thailand and don't use the house pellet, you're likely not to catch too much. So I've introduced that in with my mainline boilies, a little bit of corn as well, and then I've coated it with a smart liquid, added, added a bit of hot water as well, just to um, give it some life and uh, just almost scald the pellet a little bit and a tin of corn mixed in as well. So that's what we've introduced for now. Not too much, about 10 spots over each rod, just to get a little bit of activity in the area. And I'm just gonna see what happens. Um, and it might be a case of just every, every hour and a half, a couple of little spoms over the top, just to get some bait falling through the water column um, and keep those fish interested. So it is winter. Action does tend to be in little spells and windows. So you've got to stay composed, stay calm, and uh, hopefully it won't be too long before we uh, pick off a Blue Lake carp. Fortunately, it seemed like we got things right as after a few hours, the middle rod on the bait was away. Or so I thought. Before the take came to a bizarre halt, it was time to inspect what had happened. Oh, no, we're on. <laughs> Well, that was a strange bite, if ever I've seen one. The first fish turned out to be one of the smaller scaly ones, which explains the peculiar pickup. Let's get him in the net, get off the mark. There we go. Definitely one of the smaller ones in here, without a shadow of a doubt, but uh, beggars can't be choosers. So we're off to a nice start and hopefully I'll get to see some of the bigger ones. This fish was caught on a spinner rig with the yellow toasted almond mainline pop-ups soaked in mango nana, pineapple supreme and the new isotonic goo. Since being a young kid, I always change the hook after every fish. This is even more imperative with a super sharp fine pointed hook like the incredible Kamakura crank. Why do all the hard work and then jeopardize success with a less than perfect hook? Even if I get a fast bite, I always want the freshest hook bait possible back out there. Something that is dripping in water soluble attraction for me is the most appealing item in the swim and in cold water this is even more critical as the fish's senses are at their lowest so a super good up hook bait over the smart liquid lace loose feed is a must. This is assisting you in getting the quickest bite possible in any given situation. Well another, another tickle not that far after. Hit the last one, just about an hour and 30 minutes since we rechucked, so that's really good. Followed that recast of about seven spoms of the house pellet, 10 mil cell, 15 mil fiber, half a tin of corn, a few squeezes of the smart liquid over it, and then followed that up with a bit of hot water, and uh, it's gone again. So yeah, just trickling it in all the time, very similar to what I do in the summer on different venues, but more a case of putting in less and then topping it up as and when I think I might need it. Well, let, let the fish tell me, you know, or if there's been a long period where nothing's happened, just a couple of little, little spudfuls over the top to rejuvenate your spot. This fish is getting close. Both the first two bites are on Ronnie Riggs or spinners, whatever you want to call them. And they are with isotonic goo infused mainline pop-ups and uh, they've also got pineapple supreme and mango nana on them so a mix of all three brilliant for this time of year you really really can pick them out and I actually tie all my pop-ups off at the minute I don't know why I do it when it gets cold just one of those things I've done for years I always just use a little fake maggot on the top Probably because I think, oh, you know, the fish have been picking out more naturals as it gets uh, towards the back end of the year, but that's absolute baloney because they eat them all year long. So these, um, these fish that have gone into broom, C3s and C4s, some of them are already doubles and 20s. So this is looking more like the double figure stamp. There you go, look, you can see the pop-up sticking out, the red kicker on the, on the spinner and a size four Kamakura, absolutely slap bang in the bottom lip. Cool, number two, a lovely looking carp, that one. Look at that. Well, this lake is definitely going to get a lot more mature and grown up. Currently, I'm caked in mud, but smiling because look at that, a stunning, stunning mirror carp. I'm going to give myself about £13 for that one. 
they're growing very nicely in here and still that is one of the smaller ones so they are getting bigger the tactics are working do you know what i haven't changed a single thing from our fish in the summer how about that even in the dark it's critical to get that rod back out on the money let's get that nice drop really important to get that firm drop that i've been getting each cast if it doesn't go down up i'll re wind it back in and redo it there you go even with that mono you could still feel that just that slightly firmer sensation which means we're sitting on harder better bottom to present a hook bait and again doesn't change summer spring summer autumn winter you still want it presented on the best bottom possible the sort of spots that you know they've been feeding on or they're likely to feed on and find your hook bait easier. With the fish clearly in one of those winter feeding windows, I topped up the swim with seven spodfuls of bait. With a big stock of carp, this is a good amount of food, but always remember, I can use more loose feed as I know my hook baits are super attractive and stand out from the pack. So even if they just have a little feed, I've still got a great chance of a bite. Well, we're in fish number three, or the fifth, third fish we've hooked. <laughs> And it's the same rod still, and that's typical of winter fishing, really. Um, that's why, you know, coming to a new water for the first time, I've got two different approaches, actually, on this rod. This is, the, the as I say, the same one that's gone, the Ronnie rig with the uh, isotonic pineapple supreme and manganana pop-up on it. And on the right, just probably feet, like a few feet away, like inches, if you like, is a solid bag with pellets infused with smart liquid and goo and uh and on that one a pink pop-up that's just not that's just not gone it's crazy really see that happen a lot so that's why it does pay to often fish two rods on one spot and then the left one is on its own again on another spinner with the same same sort of uh, goo goo infused isotonic and the uh, pineapple you've heard it all before now this one's just out here having a little splash about. Dumpy little fella. Looks like a nice, pretty fish. All welcome during the winter, and this is this is why you pick the right venue. You can have some great sport in cold water conditions, and a, another lovely, lovely linear. <laughs> Cracking little fish. Well, we've been very unlucky with the size. We've actually weighed this one. It's eight and a half pounds, so definitely one of the smaller of the stockies that went in. But look at it, an absolute creature. And that, for me, is what winter fishing is all about. Going to venues that you get a little tickle on. You can test some rigs, test some baits. And when you're catching carp as beautiful as this, who actually cares how big they are? Incredibly, the same rod has done all three bites, whilst the solid bag just a few feet away has sat there motionless. When it's three bites to zero between rods, that's the time to make a change. So I retie the solid bag, but this time I put on the same hook bait that has done all three fish. The isotonic manganana and pineapple supreme combo has been a real winner on Monster Carp filming in 2018 for season four, and it seems to be just as splendid in the depths of winter in the UK. That citrus appeal really gives the hook bait extra zing, which is clearly making a difference on this spot. Fresh bag, back on the spot, and the next rod to go was the solid bag. So, just goes to show, can tweak it in the winter, little hook bait change. Get a bite. Let's get this net. This is close to the bank. This fish. Another one. Another baby. <laughs> there we go. A sucker for a solid bag. But ironically, I decided not to cast the solid bag out again. It was time for a little in-session trial. Not long after that solid bag, caught fishes returned. Ronnie rig on the same spot has just ripped off. That's why I try something new and just leave the spot and see if I can pick out a bigger fish. And this one definitely feels like a, a better stamp. Oh, these nails. Yeah, it's lovely. That's a better one. Well, this is what we came for a 20 pounder in the depths of winter and what a lovely carpet is. Have a look at that. 
22 and a half pounds and that is certainly one of the ones that has packed the weight on early doors awesome awesome carp and um, yeah tiny little tweak really this time I've not recast the solid bag and I've not put any bait out because I just wanted to see if I left it alone if one of the bigger carp will come in a little bit after the commotion of bait going in and picking up that hook bait and that's exactly what happened so awesome stuff this stunning winter 20 was the last fish of the trip, but it really proved how small in-session tweaks are the difference between success and failure, not wholesale changes. This chapter has been all about showing you the fine lines we all face during a fishing session. Horseshoe was really testing, but a last minute move onto a different shoal of fish in Winter Bay with the awesome zig rig saved the day. I've seen it so many times on big waters, just finding a different group of fish in another area of the lake can be the difference. Old Berry Hill provided a new set of challenges. First off was changing my main line from mono to apex braid to land the next fish that took my spinner rig set up against those infamous snags. Then we were faced with a frenzied bream attack that made me reevaluate where the carp had moved to. With the rods in deeper open water, we had three bites in super quick succession. No change of rigs or bait and no panic alarms, just intelligent adjustments when needed. All along this journey, fishing three completely different waters, I haven't been chasing for the latest Fandango rig or worrying about what I should use here or there. My Go Anywhere Armoury has proven through years of fishing all across Europe that it will work anywhere. The solid bag, the spinner rigs and the zig rig really produce the goods everywhere when coupled with the fine bait choices I've shown you. Find them, feed them and they will come.